Epoxides are really in a league of their own when it comes to ethers because unlike essentially all other ethers, the epoxide oxygen can act as a nuclear fusion in its own right without prior protonation in many cases. Under mildly basic conditions, we can observe opening of the epoxide ring in what amounts to a substitution reaction of one of the CO bonds within the epoxide ring. That said, we can also do this substitution process under acidic conditions, and the site selectivity, where the nucleophile bonds, actually depends on whether acidic or basic conditions are used. So we're going to explain this and look at some examples on this slide, and again, where we're really focusing our attention is on substitution reactions of one of the carbon-oxygen bonds within the epoxide. These are the most important reactions of epoxides by far. So let's look at two different reaction conditions and observe what happens. First, let's look at acidic conditions. Let's imagine, for example, that we treated an epoxide with H2SO4, an aqueous solution, along with some neutral nucleophile that I'm just gonna call new H with a lone pair. So something like an alcohol or an amine or something like this. These are acidic conditions due to the strong acid used. And really, of course, under these reaction conditions, the H2SO4 is just going to form H3O plus quantitatively, and so you may see H3O plus just written under these reaction conditions as well. We're going to contrast this with a different set of conditions in which we either start with a nucleophile and treat with strong base, or use a nucleophile that is intrinsically strongly basic that's anionic, something like O minus, N minus, or even C minus. And over here, of course, we're looking at strongly basic conditions because the nucleophile used, if it's strong, will also be strongly Bronsted basic. Here's what we observe when we run these reactions. Under basic conditions, the nucleophile ends up bound to the less substituted carbon selectively. This means that the CO bond on the right in the example we're looking at here remains intact and the CO bond on the left is broken. And the product we end up with, and I should add, this is after treatment with aqueous acid during workup. So let's do H3O plus as a second step during workup to generate the neutral alcohol. The product we generate contains a new carbon nucleophile bond at the less substituted carbon of the starting epoxide. This carbon has reacted selectively under basic conditions. One quick note about this, is that the stereocenter that's present in the starting epoxide is unaffected by this reaction since the carbon-oxygen bond on the right never actually breaks. So its configuration is the same. Configuration is retained from the starting materials to the product. Under acidic conditions, as you might imagine, otherwise we wouldn't have much to explain, the opposite site selectivity is observed. The left-hand carbon-oxygen bond does not break, and in fact substitution happens selectively at the right-hand carbon, the more substituted carbon. Under acidic conditions, the nucleophile ends up bound to the more substituted carbon of the epoxide. This carbon, the more substituted carbon, reacts selectively under acidic conditions. So we've got an interesting observation that the selectivity of nucleophilic substitution of epoxides depends on the conditions used and the strength of the nucleophile. Now we need to explain this. And as we've already seen a number of times throughout the course, the key to explanations in organic reactions is to think about mechanism. What intermediates, for example, are involved in this process? Well, let's focus on the acidic case first. In the presence of a strong acid like H3O+, the epoxide oxygen is going to do what it does best and become protonated. And we've seen this kind of reactivity for ethers already. Protonation of the epoxide oxygen just generates a protonated epoxide, which is a cyclic analog of the protonated ethers that we've seen already. Now, given our prior discussion about partial charge in neutral epoxides, we can extend that idea to the protonated epoxide and think about where is this positive charge really? Where is it really? Well, think about non-traditional resonance structures in which we break these carbon-oxygen bonds within the protonated epoxide ring. Which carbon is likely to bear more positive charge? The more substituted carbon will bear more par partial positive charge than the less substituted carbon because this carbon is better at supporting positive charge. Another way of putting this is that the most important alternative resonance form of the protonated epoxide 
involves placing positive charge on the more substituted carbon rather than the less substituted carbon. And if you looked at, for example, calculated partial charges, they would bear this out. The partial charge on the more substituted carbon is much greater than the partial charge on the less substituted carbon. The result is that the nucleophile, which is of course partially negatively charged, will attack selectively at the carbon bearing the greater partial positive charge. There's just a charge control effect going on here. And when this happens, we end up with a bond formed between the nucleophile and the more substituted carbon of the epoxide. And although I won't draw it out in detail, you can imagine that after this SN2 step occurs, the nucleophile will be positively charged and linked to a hydrogen, which can be deprotonated to generate the observed product, in which we have a new carbon nucleophile bond between the nucleophile and the more substituted carbon of the epoxide ring. So under acidic conditions, charge control, the fact that the partially negative nucleophile is attracted more strongly to the partially positive epoxide carbon that has the greater partial positive charge, explains the outcome. What about under basic conditions? Well, the explanation under basic conditions is actually a little bit more straightforward. Under basic conditions, the reaction occurs in a single SN2 elementary step. And the selectivity here is just driven by steric effects. Kinetically, the anionic nucleophile has a much easier time reaching the less substituted carbon for an SN2 step than it does reaching the more substituted carbon. And this is typical of SN2 reactions of strong nucleophiles. Now one thing I should mention is that this will generate an alkoxide anion, and so in fact after the SN2 step we do have another elementary step which is a proton transfer under the conditions of workup to generate the product. That said, the constitution of the product really and the position of the new carbon nucleophile bond is set by the first SN2 step. So just to summarize again one more time, when an epoxide is treated with a weak nucleophile under acidic conditions, protonation of the epoxide occurs and this leads to a charge control situation in which the site of greater partial positive charge within the epoxide ring reacts selectively. That leads to the product in which the carbon nucleophile bond involves the more substituted carbon of the epoxide. But under basic conditions, the opposite selectivity is observed. The nucleophile forms a bond to the less substituted carbon. And this just has to do with the classic SN2 steric effect. The anionic nucleophile has an easier time reaching the less substituted carbon than the more substituted carbon.